The uh, first thing I'd like to do is just to get your name first and last in the correct spelling so I have it on tape. So if you go ahead and give me that. Oh, my name is William, middle initial E, Welch, W-E-L-C-H. Great. All right. So uh, you're a Washingtonian for from forever? Almost, yeah, actually, except during the uh, four years I was in the Army in World War II. Other than that, I'm a Washingtonian. Now, did you grow up in the Spokane area? Or? Uh, pretty much so. I, I was born on a farm in Valley, Washington, which is a small town about 50 miles north of here. And I lived for about seven years in uh, the Idaho Panhandle. My, my uh, grandfather and dad were mining, were mining men. Oh, really? But uh, for all practical purposes, I've lived in Spokane uh, since uh, 1933. Wow. Now, you, you said prior to the war you ended up over in Bremerton for a while. Yes, I worked in the Navy Yard there. I got a job in the Navy Yard. How, how'd you get the job? How old were you and how'd you get the job? I was 19, just turned 19 years, 19 years. And my dad was working over there. And he said, you ought to come over here and get a job. I had a job, but it wasn't a very good job, but it was a job. So I put in my application and I was accepted. So I, I moved myself, I was single then, moved myself to, to Bremerton. And uh, I worked in the uh, outside machine shop. I worked on... Uh, most of the battleships that were sunk in Pearl Harbor and, and towed back to Bremerton for uh, reconstruction. And the uh, first one I worked on was the Saratoga, the aircraft carrier that was torpedoed in the Coral Sea. And that's where I was working at the time I got my draft notice. Wow. So where were you when you heard about um, Pearl Harbor? Do you remember? Yes, I was, I was working here in Spokane in an automobile storage garage, Cooper Garage. and. Uh, I was working that day, just on Sunday, as everybody knows, and I heard it on the radio. I got to adjust. When Pearl Harbor got bombed, 19? I was, uh, I just turned, I was 19. I was 19. So did you realize what that meant at that time? I know a lot of people say, well, I was just a kid. And... No, yes, yes, I, I uh, recognized the significance of it. I was also, at that time, I was... Uh, I was a member of the Washington State Guard because the regular National Guard was federalized in 1941, or 40, excuse me, in 1940, September of 40, and so they had to have somebody to take up the slack, so they recruited what they called the uh, Washington State uh, Guard, and I was a member of that, and uh, we would go to drill down to the armory, we had uniforms and had rifles and had all that good stuff, you know. Not much training, however, because most all of us had another job to do or were going to school or something like that. But uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, they uh, put us on guard duty to guard, oh, the, we guarded the bridges and power plants, telephone exchanges, any, and our dams and power dams around here, any installation that could be sabotaged, they put us on guard duty. And uh, the police would take us out to our position on the bridge or at the dam or something, <laughs> give us a nightstick. <laughs> and I thought, here I am out here in the middle of the night with a nightstick trying to protect this bridge from saboteurs. <laughs> I thought that was kind of kind of ridiculous. So I said to the policeman, I says, say, I'd like to have a gun out here. Could I bring my gun? Sure, if you got a gun, bring it. So uh, my... Uh, to be father-in-law, had a pistol that he loaned me. So I was walking around this bridge with that pistol tucked in my belt, feeling pretty big, you know. I had a pistol now. <laughs> where, where was the bridge, over this side? Well, it was Green Street Bridge, across the river. Are you familiar with Spokane at all? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's down there, out there by the community college there, that Green Street Bridge. Oh, okay. There. I'm a uh, and then they'd come back every once in a while, the police, and check on us, see if we're still all right, you know. And then when it's the end of our shift, They'd bring somebody else out and pick us up. But we did that only at night. We didn't uh, patrol those areas in the daytime, but at night. I guess he figured it was going to be a night attack. I guess so. <laughs> so that was my first experience of doing any kind of guard or military duty. Was that um, taken pretty seriously? Yes, yes. Well, those of us who were going to drill, that was a non-paying thing. 
it was a volunteer thing, and yes, we took it very seriously. And because uh, you felt that was a, a real threat. Well, yeah, cause, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought if the if the uh, city government and police wanted us out there, that there was a reason for it. So we went. So then you ended up working in the in the shipyard, and you got your navy yard. Yeah, yeah, we're in Bremerton, and, yep. and you got your draft notice. I got my draft notice. Yeah, and uh, the, the navy had sent me to school to train me uh, to be an ordnance mechanic, and uh, which was good. This was a better paying job, a little more responsibility and whatnot, you know. And uh, so when my draft notice came, uh, I told my supervisor, I had my draft notice, they said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll get you deferred. He said, we need you. We've trained you. We need you. I said, well, that's fine. And uh, they even, uh, they even, if I was bound determined to go, they even offered me a slot in the Navy as a third class petty officer because of my experience in order in uh, Navy ordinance. Well, I thought, gee, if I'm going to go into service, that sounds like a pretty good deal. But then a light went on up in my head, and I suddenly remembered that I was prone to get seasick. I said, I don't think I want to be seasick for <laughs> an undetermined amount of time. So uh, I turned down the deferment and was drafted in the Army, and uh, I reported uh, for duty right after Christmas two days after Christmas in 1942 at Fort Lewis. And uh, I thought, well, as long as I'm going to be in the Army, I'd like to be in an armored unit. I want to be in the, in the, in the tank or So I waited and waited, and no, no slot for me any place, you know. Finally, they called me and said, say, we got something that's pretty close to tanks. It's a new unit called, it, it's a tank destroyer unit. I said, well, that sounds good to me. Ship me out. <laughs> so they shipped me out, and uh, I went to uh, Camp Bowie, Texas. Uh, Camp Bowie, Texas was one of those tar paper shack deals that was erected for World War II. That's exactly what it was. It was tar paper shacks sitting up on concrete blocks that housed about 25 men. He would heat it with a pot-bellied stove, and it was in early January, and it was cold down there. And so in the we were in the tar paper shacks, and that's where we took our basic training, because this was just a newly formed battalion, and uh, so we took about 13 weeks of basic training there at Camp Bowie, and then they had finished building Camp Hood, which is now Fort Hood, a permanent hood, and we moved up to Hood. In fact, we were the second battalion to move into in the Hood, and uh, this was in the summertime. We moved in there in uh, April. And it was already pretty hot. And uh, our battalion commander was the senior battalion commander on the post, so he had his choice of putting his troops in the barracks, the nice new barracks on the post, or camping in the field. He said, we're going to the field. This battalion commander, he was a, he was a tough old bird. He was a former National Guard artillery officer. We called him, when he wasn't listening, Colonel Smoothbore. And he was, he was a taskmaster, but it was good because we needed somebody like that for, for that uh, phase of our training. We needed a tough one, and he was. How, how old do you think he was? He was in his 50s, early 50s. Oh, okay, so he was. Too, 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 old, too old to go to combat with a battalion, but good to train one. And when he got us fully trained, he brought in a much younger uh, battalion commander to take it to combat, much younger uh, officer. But... Uh, uh, on that uh, historical background that I made up for Colonel Gordon that I leave you a copy of, uh, there's some stories in there about some incidents that happened there that were kind of humorous. Uh, one of them was, uh, it was very hot there, no air conditioning. These were large hangar type buildings with the classrooms. And it was hot in there, very hot, especially right after lunch. You'd had a, you'd had a hot meal. You get sleepy, listening to some guy on the yap stand up there, you know, and you have a tendency to fall asleep. Well, their cure for that was uh, the so assistant instructors. This is uh, Q6 News is here. They want to come in and shoot a picture. Yeah, that's fine. Just come back. Take questions. I'll answer after. 
the news is going to, Q6 is going to okay. Oh, okay. sneak right. in on us. Oh, all, all right. On all right. Chatting away. So a couple of the uh, assistant instructors were armed with M80 firecrackers. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with an M80, but that's a very powerful firecracker. <laughs> About as powerful as a quarter pound stick of dynamite, you know. So if you fell asleep, they'd roll one of those under your chair. Well, needless to say, that was a rude awakening. Then, when we were in the field, we were taking the demolitions training, and we're out in the field, and there is no shade down there in Fort Hood, no shade at all. And it must have been 110, I don't know. And uh, we were studying hand grenades. And there was one soldier there that couldn't keep awake after lunch. He kept falling asleep. So the instructor walks over to a box of hand grenades and picks up two fragmentation pineapples, grenades. Walks over, puts one in each hand, and pulls a pin on it. So he said, now, soldier, do you think you can stay awake? Well, these were dummy grenades, but the soldier didn't know that. <laughs> but needless to say, he didn't go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some humorous things that happened along the way. Did, did the... Uh... When did you actually start working with the tank, the physical tank destroyers? Well, we, when we moved to, uh, when we were at uh, Camp Bowie taking our basic train, we had that half track with the 75 on the one that, that they used uh, primarily in North Africa. That's what we had initially. Then when we moved to Camp Hood, they took those away from us and they made us a towed unit. We had a three-inch naval gun mounted on a 105 howitzer carriage towed with a half-track. We had a 10-man crew because we were not only qualified and equipped to do direct fire against tanks primarily, pillboxes or troops or anything, we could also were trained to do direct fire, artillery-type fire. And in combat, we did a lot of that for harassing and interdiction fires because it, it, uh, that ammunition for that three-inch gun wasn't as costly as for a 155 or a 105. But uh, at Hood, we trained with, uh, the, uh, with the towed gun behind this half-track. And then we didn't become self-propelled until in combat. When we, were, uh, we had paused at the Ruhr River, and at that time we made the switch from our towed guns to our M10 tank destroyer. And uh, I gave you some photos of the M10. It looks, it resembles a tank, except it's a much larger silhouette. And the main difference is the turret is open. It's not closed like a tank is. The turret is, is open. But it had a bigger gun than the tank. It was faster uh, and a uh, very good vehicle for uh, uh, tank destroyer work. It had a very thin skin on it. Didn't have the heavy armor like tanks had. But if you were hit with an 88, it didn't make any difference how much armor you had. It's going to go through you. <laughs> so you didn't have to worry about whether you had four inches of armor or whether you had eight. That thing was going to go through you. So you landed at the beach when? D plus? We, we went, landed on the beach on D plus uh, 20. Uh, we were scheduled to land earlier, but the channel got so rough they couldn't land our equipment. So we sat out there seasick. <laughs> there was here that why you didn't yep. get in the navy. Yep. 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 So what was your duty on the on the destroyer? Well, at that that time I was a sergeant, and I was a gun commander, and I was in charge of of uh, the three inch gun and a ten man crew. That was my job at the time that we uh, landed on the beach. And at the time we landed on the beach, uh, the troops were only about four miles inland, and. Uh, that's when, at that time, we actually were physically attached then to our parent unit. And uh, uh, our company was attached to the 116th Infantry Regiment, which, as I told you a few moments ago, was the uh, Maryland, West Virginia National Guard unit. They were, they were the 116th that took the blunt of it on Omaha Beach. They, uh, they suffered that was around 5,000 lost on Omaha Beach. Now, how aware of that were you? 
I mean, did you know what you were headed into? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we were sitting back in the marshalling yards at Southampton waiting to go, and of course we received all the news, you know, and we were pretty well kept abreast of what was going on uh, across the channel. So we knew, we knew what we were getting into. And uh, uh, I reported in to the regimental commander, told him who I was, and I was reporting in for, for a duty assignment. And he said, who'd you say you were? <laughs> I told him. He said, well, what do you do? I said, you know, this is kind of odd. <laughs> You're the regimental commander. So I told him uh, what our tank destroyer mission was and what our capabilities were. And he says, well, he says, park your vehicle over there in that orchard until I figure out what I'm going to do with you. So <laughs> we parked in the orchard over there. And a uh, few, few hours later, uh, we were told that we had been assigned to a battalion, an infantry battalion. It was the uh, first battalion. And so anyway, uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, it didn't take very long with our firepower to demonstrate to them that we were a valuable part of the team. And uh, they treated us like we were family, almost right away. They were a little leery at first, you know, they didn't know what the heck we, we could do, you know. But we had that, that three-inch gun and a 50 caliber machine gun, and the infantry liked those big weapons up with them. And we moved right along with them. We moved right along with them. When they went, we went. Do, do you remember landing at the beach? Do you remember what your... Oh, I mean, yeah. Is that a movie that runs in your head all the time now, or is that something that... Oh, I, uh, I uh, remember every detail like it happened yesterday. And uh, we, uh, when he we went off of the LST, we traveled about uh, 50 yards or so in water. And, of course, we had prepared our uh, vehicles and our guns with waterproofing so we could do this. And we forded about... Oh, about 32 inches of water for about 50 yards before we reached the beach. And uh, the worst thing that happened to me on that day is we were climbing there's a hill that goes up from the beach like this. And if you saw the movie The Longest Day, you saw that hill. This is where Robert Mitchum, was, was who played the part of General Coda, the assistant division commander, was urging the troops to move. Anyway, we're going up the hill. It's a hot day. And the dog on half track developed a vapor lock. <laughs> so I had to pull over and sit and wait for that thing to cool down a couple of times. So uh, I didn't reach our first initial bivouac area until about an hour after all the rest of our unit had closed in. So that was the, the first glitch I had on that particular day on our landing there. Was it chaotic or was it so well planned and you were so well trained that... Well, we were... We were well trained. I'd like to think we were. We were, we were well trained. But uh, uh, your first introduction to the battle area is a whole new experience for you. But, uh, and anybody who tells you he's not, wasn't scared is either a liar or a fool. <laughs> because, sure, we were, we were apprehensive, you know, because uh, we're only four miles inland. And uh, so we, you don't know where what's waiting for you. And you're all what? 20 now? No, yeah, I'm just 20, turned 20. I just turned 20. And this is your very first seeing uh, full action? This was our initiation to combat. How, how quickly did you grow up? I mean, was that, had they trained, I mean, is there anything that they did that could, could really prepare you for that? Well, yes. Uh, there were many basic things that they taught you from, from the first day that, that they started giving you your basic training that you need to apply at all times, you know, to help you to survive in the battle area. And uh, if you learned your lessons, and I think we did, and, uh, but uh, no two situations are quite alike. Every, every day was a new experience. Was it still pretty active on the beach when you landed? Only at, only at night, of course the beach had been secured, but only at night when the, when the German bombers would come. They would come at night. They didn't dare stick their necks out in the daytime because uh, we, had, we pretty much had uh, air superiority. But they would come at night and they would bomb the, uh, the beachhead uh, to knock out supplies and disrupt the supply and whatnot. And then uh, 
after they had dropped their bomb load on their way on their way out, they would uh, strafe and drop anti-personnel bombs on the front line troops, and uh, uh, these anti-personnel mines. There were ten mortar shells encased in a metal uh, casing type deal, and they dropped it out, and then it would open up and scatter these things around. And uh, uh, they were more harassing than anything else because we were all dug in. I mean, we were in our foxholes, and uh, we slept in them, and, and uh, that's where we were. But we uh, nicknamed him uh, Bed Check Charlie because every night Charlie would come <laughs> and tuck us into bed with a few anti-personnel bombs and some strafing. And you knew they were coming. Yeah. yeah. So when was the first time that you saw um, daylight action that you had to go into to, to duty with your tank destroyer? Well, we were uh, we were uh, in the defensive posture uh, at all times because because our job was to protect uh, our uh, forces from enemy tanks. But in Normandy, uh, there wasn't a lot of tank activity there because of the hedgerows. It was poor tank country, very poor, narrow roads, and uh, it made the tanks vulnerable to uh, to uh, uh, anti-tank guns that were towed anti-tank guns that the Germans would dig in, and all that would be above the ground would be the muzzle. And uh, so it made, it limited greatly uh, the movement of armor. But so our position was that so we were always in a, in a position to defend against uh, German armor. And sometimes uh, you'd get to shoot, sometimes you didn't. So you, you tracked in from the beach, how far did you end up going with your you went in uh, across the river, you went in, how, how far in before you started? Because you came out of a, a kind of more of a, a village setting into to cities and things of well, that sort. Well, the, right? the first big fight that we had was St. Lowe. And as you know, that was a long, hard fight. And that was our last stronghold. Uh, the fact is, uh, Patton was just waiting for St. Lowe to fall so he could come with his third army and make a big dash uh, to Paris. And the fact is, uh, the story goes that uh, Patton told Bradley, he says, Brad, he says, if you get your infantrymen off their butts and take St. Lowe, you guys can sit back and rest, and I'll do the rest. Because <laughs> Patton was driving so so hard and so fast yeah. that... Uh, yeah. Everybody couldn't but until St. Lowe was taken, he couldn't go because St. Lowe was the uh, was the last holdout, and that's why they f they uh, fought so hard for it. It was a hard fight. Uh, in fact, is uh, the 82nd Airborne was right across the road from us, and they also had a tank destroyer battalion, which was from Washington. It was a Washington National Guard unit, the 803rd. And they sent a company of destroyers. They were self-propelled into St. Lowe. That's 12 destroyers in a company. And the next morning, they all walked back home. They lost all of them in St. Lowe that night. But anyway, St. Lowe was taken just a few days later. And uh, the 29th Infantry Division, which I was attached to, uh, took the town. And then that enabled uh, Patton and his Third Army to move, to move out. Before that, he he had no maneuver room. He, he couldn't move. Where, now, you faced a, a tank head-to-head -head, uh, and had kind of a close encounter. Is that <laughs> a close encounter several times. Yeah. Uh, I think the most spectacular one was uh, in the town of Jackarath, which is a small town, very small town. And it was uh, between the Ruhr and the Rhine River. And... Uh, we had attacked the town early in the morning. When I say we, are talking about the infantry and our destroyers had attacked the town. We took the town, but uh, we hardly had time to uh, prepare to defend the town or to continue the attack when the Germans launched a powerful counterattack. They had eight tanks with them. And, uh, they counterattacked almost immediately so they could recover and get their act together. And uh, they left two tanks out about, oh, 
1,500 to 2,000 meters. This was rolling hill country, and they left them in defilade out there so they could fire on the town, but we didn't have much of a target. All was, you could see was the tops of their turrets and their gun. And they sent the other six tanks around to the flank, to, to flank the town. And uh, they were able, to, they came into town. They came into town and raised a lot of havoc. They knocked out three of our destroyers, and I was the only one left. And I was busy exchanging fire with these two tanks that are out there at 1,500 meters or so. And the uh, next thing I knew, my company commander climbed up on the back of the destroyer and tapped me on the back, and he says, uh, Welsh, they're in behind you. Oh, well, that's great. So anyway, I had to move. So uh, we moved to, to a position to meet them head on. And there was, uh, I'm at one corner, and he's at the other corner, one short block away. And we're both peeking around the corner with our turrets, hoping to get a shot. Well, we got the first shot in, but it bounced off of that frontal armor, that Tiger tank. I, I could just as well throw a snowball at him. And uh, so I says, we can't stay here. <laughs> he's going to come down here and punch us out because all we had to shoot at was the frontal armor, and that's eight inches of homogeneous steel. Our gun couldn't, couldn't penetrate it. So we uh, were backing up to take another position, and uh, we had manual travers on the M10 destroyer, whereas tanks had power travers, so they could traverse that turret much quicker. And uh, I don't know whether my gunner was slow in traversing or whether the driver uh, was a little too anxious to get out of there, but we, we backed up and the end of the muzzle caught on a telegraph pole sitting there and it stripped the traversing mechanism. And that turret spun, I swear it spun for an hour. It didn't, but I swear it did, it, it was spinning. So I ordered the crew to abandon the tank and we took our bazooka with us and uh, we had a light machine gun and the rest of the crew was already out and I had this 30 caliber machine gun cradled in my arms and so I was standing on the engine compartment getting ready to leap off of the tank when that second round hit us. <laughs> I think I probably leaped about eight feet off of that thing. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, with the, the bazookas that we had in that town, we knocked three of their tanks out and drove the rest of them out because they did a dumb thing. They didn't bring their infantry in with them to protect them from individual tank measures. That's important. They didn't do that. It was dumb of them. And so we were able to sneak up on them and, uh, with these bazookas and, uh, and knock them out. But we, uh, we, when I say we saved the town, but uh, it was not only our efforts with our individual tank measure, but I was looking through my field glasses and I see more antennas traversing across out there about 300 meters than I'd ever seen before. And it was the second armored division, the hell on wheels. They bailed us out. They bailed us out. Because I'm sure, I don't think that those tanks would have left that town unless they knew that that armored division was coming. I don't think they would have. So I don't know what would have happened. I'm going to be here today. <laughs> and, and that's where, again, it sounds like that discipline comes in, the combination of, you know, a tank's only so good in the infantry, and you got to have... you got to have... you got to work together. And uh, uh, because... Uh, now, if you're attacking in an open area where the tanks can see well, you know, it's not so important because it's difficult for anybody to sneak up on you. But if you're in a town, especially if the streets are narrow in Europe, the streets are narrow, and uh, you're blind, and uh, uh, because of the uh, enemy infantry, you have to button up or they'll shoot you with a rifle or a machine gun. So you're buttoned up so they're blind. So they got to have their infantry on the ground to protect them from, from this guy with a bazooka or a... Molotov cocktail, 
or the Russians stop probably stop more tanks with a crowbar than any other method. Those Russians, they they were pretty bold, and they just sneak up on a tank and and jam a a uh, crowbar into the track mechanism and throw the track. And once the tank is stopped, he's a sitting duck. Because I was going to say, the tank's limited in the fact that it's got, what, one gun and then maybe a other gun, but that's it. If you can get in close enough, then... Yeah, and if, he, if, if he's buttoned up, you can sneak up on him, probably. Or if he's in it, he can't do nothing about it anyway. <laughs> he's inside. You're outside. He can't do nothing. How many... Uh, when you traveled, how many tank destroyers did you travel with? Well, uh, there was... Uh, <clears throat> I belonged to a battalion... And there are three line companies in a battalion, and each line company had 12 destroyers. So that was a total of 36 destroyers in a battalion. But uh, we usually worked in smaller groups. Two destroyers, two destroyers were usually assigned the mission of uh, working with an infantry, one infantry battalion. That was normal, but it varied. It varied upon the situation. Sometimes there was only one destroyer. Uh, so it just depended upon the situation. And, and how thin you were spread. And are you right up front? Right up with the infantry, yeah. Because you've got to get the big tanks gone before they come in. Yeah, not only that, uh, we probably fired on more targets other than tanks. Uh, we would fire on uh, uh, any type of gun and play for the machine gun nest. We'd fire on infantry in the open. Uh, many, there were many targets that we fired on, other than tanks, many. So that big gun was, uh, was uh, a lot of support for those uh, marching infantrymen. Plus we had a 50 caliber machine gun, and that's a powerful weapon. And we had a 30 caliber light machine gun mounted on the turret. So we had an awful lot of firepower, and the infantrymen liked that, because they couldn't carry that. They don't have it. I'm going to take a break just for a real quick second yep. to see if I got to an answer. Anything. I didn't know that. In the South Pacific, you know, they they you you had the fearful. I mean, because the, the Japanese were hidden and everything like that. Was Europe like that, or did you no. pretty well know where your enemy was? No. Uh, to compare Europe with the South Pacific is just two different ball games altogether, because of the terrain, jungle. It was jungle warfare, and that was so different from. Uh, uh, that Europe is open, open and flat, excellent tank country. That's why the Germans made so many tanks. And uh, uh, the only reason that we were able to uh, overcome their, their tanks was that we probably had about five to one of theirs. We, we overpowered them by sheer numbers because our Sherman tank, which was our main battle tank, was no match for the German heavy tanks, the uh, Tiger and the Panther. The Germans' main battle tank was a Mark IV tank. And, uh, but it had a bigger gun. It had that, that 88. And you know that 88 was the most famous direct fire weapon of World War II. And it was unchallenged. I mean, it was the best there was. And the interesting story about that was it was uh, designed by a by uh, either a Swede or a Norwegian. I think it was a Norwegian. And he tried to sell it to England. Now, this is back before the war. He tried to sell it to England. England didn't buy it. He tried to sell it to the United States. The United States didn't buy it. He sold it to Germany. <laughs> Germany bought a lot of it. Yeah. 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 But later on in World War II, we, we came up with a 90 millimeter, which was just a mark below the uh, capabilities of the 88. The 88 still had the most velocity. And if you're going to knock out a tank, that's what you need is the velocity to penetrate the armor. And uh, the, the Tiger tank had a velocity of about 3,600 feet a second. Ours was about 33 feet a second, our, our uh, three-inch gun. Then we came up with a 90, which was probably about 34 feet per second but still wasn't the gun that the 88 was. And uh, they had so many 88s that were uh, versatile weapons. Uh, they could be firing 
at anti-aircraft one minute, and a minute later they could be firing at ground targets. They were mounted on the ground, and uh, they were towed there by a vehicle, and they were mounted on the ground on a kind of a base-like deal with legs on it. And uh, so it was a very, uh, very versatile uh, weapon. Now, with the tank destroyer, was the advantage of that speed? Speed was one of them. You know, uh, your heavier tanks were slow, very slow. Probably uh, uh, on a on a good uh, roadway, a heavy tank probably wouldn't be hard pressed to go 20 miles an hour. We could go 35. That was an advantage. And uh, like I say, our gun was an advantage, even though it wasn't an advantage over the 88, but it was a good gun. It was a good gun. And uh, we had uh, one advantage of the tank was that with the open turret on the top, we had better vision. Unless we were under fire from rifle fire or machine gun fire, we could stand up in that thing and uh, the upper half of our body could be above so we could see better. So that was fine unless somebody was, a soldier was shooting at you or something. That was fine. Then you had to duck down. But the you got basically target written on you standing up there. That's right. That's right. But there's times when there was no, no uh, infantry around shooting at you. You could do that. And uh, that gave you a better uh, visibility to see what's, what, uh, what's going on out there. So what was, as you drove around, what was most of the area like that you traveled through? Oh, it looks a lot like, uh, are you familiar from the area around here? It was flat, and uh, uh, not an awful lot of not an awful lot of trees, except in certain areas, uh, like the Hungan Forest and some of those. There were lots of trees, but but most of the area it was pretty open, and you had good fields of fire. Uh, it was not uncommon to have uh, fields of fire oh, up to three thousand meters in open, in open country. Which would mean that they also have. Oh yeah, same deal. Yeah. So it's a very eye to eye combat that you're doing. It is, yeah, it is because in those days you had to physically see your target because our sighting device looked like the telescopic sight on your deer rifle. It was about the same size. That's all it was. That's all you had. Today, a tank gunner, he doesn't even see his target. It's all done computer, and uh, all he has to do is, is uh, figure out what his target is and lay on it, and then he can sit down and rest. He don't, probably doesn't see his target even. So they make kills probably uh, a couple of miles away. So what do you, when you're driving across this land, what do you see? I mean, so I don't know enough of it to know. Can mm -hmm. you see their troops all lined up? And, and no, you don't see them all lined up because because they're not going to show themselves. If they're out there, they're probably going to be uh, dug in in a foxhole or hiding beside some a stone wall or something. They're not going to show themselves because one of the first things you learn is basic things is cover and concealment. I mean, an enemy can't shoot you if he can't see you. I'm talking about direct fire weapons. Now artillery and, and mortar, they don't have to see us. They just have to know, well, he's over there someplace and he'll get you. So are you are you advancing on them and trying to push them back? No. So are, are are you how are you being I mean, if somebody's moving, how do you stay concealed? Or are you visible at that point? Well, uh you talking about uh uh an infantryman on the ground, or or a, or a, a tank destroyer, or a tank, or what? Yeah, tanks. well, you can you can conceal a tank. I mean, it's there to be seen and it's heard. You can hear them. You can hear them clanking a mile away, you know, and you can see them. Now, an infantryman, he can move from bush to bush and and tree to tree, and and uh, uh, if he's careful, he can conceal himself. And sometimes uh, he has the benefit of having some cover, but at least he can conceal himself. And uh, this was one problem we had when we first started working with the infantry. 
they didn't want to be around us very close because they knew that tanks and tank destroyers draw fire. They draw the enemy fire. They know that. So they don't want to be around. And it was a long, took a lot of training to get those infantrymen to work close to us, to protect us in the towns and stuff and where uh, uh, we were uh, vulnerable to uh, individual uh, anti-tank weapons such as the bazookas, the Panzerfaust, and, and the Molotov cocktails and all the rest of that <laughs> nice stuff. But, uh, so is the infantry, so if you're coming in through a town as an infantry then a little bit behind you and they're kind of... Well, or, 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 or off to the flank, you know. It depends upon on the terrain, what's going on, you know. And sometimes you're making an attack and you're not getting much resistance. And that's different. I mean, you can be a little more relaxed if you're not getting any, if the, if the uh, uh, troop, German troops have gone, which many times, rather than to stay and engage us to the last ditch stand and the bayonet charge, we're gone. We're gone. So did you, you ended up traveling through some, some villages then? Oh some, yeah, lots of them. So is it, because as I close my eyes and, and having never been there, you know, books I've read, I can hear the tanks but, but I see villages that are a couple stories high, so you're driving to this place where people are up and around. I mean, that has to be pretty scary there because it is. you don't know. That's why you need that infantry guy on foot down there to take care of those, those things, take care of those, those people because uh, uh, there were uh, a lot of dangers in a built-up area that you don't get out in open terrain. And uh, we trained for that, for uh, village fighting. We trained for it. But it was hard initially to get our infantrymen to stay close to us, and I can understand why, because they knew that uh, if the tanks are around, the enemy is going to open up with everything he's got. I mean, the artillery and the mortars and <laughs> everything he's got, and they're out there with uh, no protection. You know? we're, we're, we're inside. We're uh, a tank or a tank destroyer with armor doesn't have much to worry about the artillery and the mortar fire, and to worry because because uh, we had enough armor to hold off anything except a round from an anti-tank weapon, direct fire weapon. I mean, the artillery and mortar fire, that didn't hurt us very much. Very seldom did we suffer any casualties from that. But the poor infantrymen out there, that's a different ballgame. So would you, would you take um, artillery? I mean, so you could, you could either stand up top or you could hunker down in and so you could take some hits if it wasn't the anti-tank. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, if the artillery is falling all around you, uh, you're safe because there's those shell fragments will not penetrate, they won't even penetrate a, a quarter or half an inch of armor. So do you hear it hitting the, I mean, do you know you're... Oh <laughs> yeah, you know it, yeah, yeah, but... Uh, uh, they, the old saying is, uh, if you hear the burst, you're not going to get hit. It's the one that you don't hear that's going to get you. Because it, cause to hear it, it has to be a distance from you? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Huh. How, what's the hardest, uh, you told about the one where you caught your barrel on the telegraph pole. Was that the hardest hit you Oh, running? yeah, by far, yeah. Yeah, that, that round... The M10 tank destroyer had only two inches of homogeneous steel on its frontal armor. And uh, that 88 went through that frontal armor, it went through the final drive system, it went out the side of the tank, or the destroyer, through a brick building. I don't know where it went to after that. I don't know where it went. And how big is that? I mean, is it... Uh, an 88 millimeter is about, uh, well, it's 25 millimeters to an inch, so it's about three and a half inches, about three and a half inches in diameter, the projectile is, and the projectile itself is about that long. And is it, as it goes through, it's also supposed to throw, as it breaks your... Well, what it tank. does, it, it, it uh... It forces, it, it produces a lot of uh, fragments off the inside, the metal coming off of the inside. And it starts throwing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, 
the, the what they call the uh, uh, high velocity ammunition was a little different. Initially, the projectile was nothing more than a steel slug. This looked like a slug. What it looked like. Then they came up with this. There was a cone on the end of it, and that. Uh, cone-shaped thing, when it hit, would kind of act like a prick punch if you're going to drill a hole. And then there was an explosion there. And then that allowed the main projector to go on through. But what that would do, that would uh, spew a lot of, of uh, metal fragments around inside of a tank, which can be deadly to the crew inside. That can be pretty deadly. Did, did So you had how many in your tank destroyer? Okay, in the self-propelled, there were five. There was uh, there was the gun commander. There was a gunner. There was an assistant gunner who also operated the radio. And there was a loader. And uh, how many did I got? Somebody driving it. Yeah, the driver. Yeah. The driver. It's kind of an important one. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is kind of important. So, yeah. so. Was this team together all the time? I mean, is that who you, is it like pilots were? were yeah, fighting? we were together. Oh, yeah. yeah we're, the only time the difference is if somebody is, is uh, wounded or sick, then they'll send you a replacement. But uh, no, I had the same crew uh, from the time we, uh, from the time we, uh, well, actually, from the time we formed up in Camp Bowie, formed into squads, I had the same people until. We got into combat, and we got the self-propelled. So then I had to reduce my squad from ten men to five. So I got to choose the five I wanted. So I chose what I thought were the sharpest knives in the drawer, and we stayed together all the way through. Uh, I only lost uh, one. He was not seriously wounded. He was only hospitalized for about a month or so. He was my driver. And he wasn't in the destroyer when it happened. <laughs> he was out of the destroyer, and uh, the Germans opened up with a 20 millimeter automatic weapon, and, and a shell fragment got him. So you were both skilled and, and lucky. I mean, to be able to go through oh, that. Oh, oh, I was. I, I, I uh, consider myself extremely lucky. Fact is, uh, after the war. In fact, it was in about 1970 or so, I was reunited with my old World War II company commander. And uh, he had a lake place up at one of the local lakes here, and he invited my wife and I up for a weekend of fishing and whatnot. And uh, this was the first time my wife had ever met him. And he told my wife that I didn't have any right to be alive today after what he was through. No, no, I was very, very lucky. Very lucky. Were, were um, tank destroyers as a whole pretty lucky in that way, or were there a lot of casualties? Well, a lot of they they took more than their fair share of casualties. Uh, our battalion, we had six hundred and eighty some men in our battalion, and we had twenty seven killed, a uh, hundred and seven wounded, and. Uh, we had some missing in action after one engagement, but they all showed up in a POW camp later. So actually, uh, considering the ratio, uh, our losses were not as great as the infantry. There's, there's where the great losses are. And uh, that was one of the, uh, one of the uh, most heartbreaking things that I ever saw was seeing those soldiers, their bodies thrown in the back of a two and a half ton truck. Now they did it with care. They didn't do it like they were throwing a log in there. They did it with care and and, uh, and concern. But that's the only way they could get them back, haul them back in a two and a half ton truck and they were stacked in there like cordwood. And that's pretty gut-wrenching when you see that happen. How does a person deal with that? I mean, I, sure, I assume everybody's different, but, and that's, War, but for somebody that never has been there, never, hopefully, never will face it. Well, I suppose the first thing that comes to, and I'm glad that I'm not number one of those in the back of that truck. I suppose 
God has spared me. But uh, you just got to have, you just got to have faith, I guess, that, uh, that one of these days this thing is going to be over with and we can all go home. Is it um, the, the life that you're leading, I mean, because you're traveling to Europe, I assume you, like everybody else, it was wet, it was, of course you weren't down the ground, but it's wet, it's muddy, it's... Well, yeah, that's true. Well, the weather over there is not much different than it is in Spokane, really. I mean, they have, they have winters over there. The winter of uh, 44 and 45, while the bulge was going on, severe winter. Severe winter. We were living outside. We were outside all the time, and uh, uh, you were more concerned with coping with the elements of the weather than you were fighting the enemy. Fighting the enemy was secondary. Just to survive was your was your primary uh, goal. Was to survive, but it was cold. cold. Do, do you think that that? Axing away was kind of an, an advantage because it took you away from having to, I mean, your mind works in a lot of different ways, but war and staying warm yeah. and surviving and... Yeah. Uh, yes, I suppose so, but you know, uh, the thing that kind of balanced it out, the poor German soldier was in the same boat. He was cold too. <laughs> so so uh, sometimes the action kind of slowed down. Because it wasn't like action every minute, right? I mean, there was nope, a lot, nope, you would have nope. a fight and then yeah. what was it like? Yeah. Well, there were times when we would drive a uh, hundred miles and never hear a shot fired in anger. The next time, uh, you may be fighting uh, uh, forever, ever a uh, mile of the way. So it was uh, it was a sporadic thing. Depends upon where you were and what the, what the tactical situation was. We drove into a lot of German towns where where uh, we hadn't, where the Germans were not defending. The Germans had already pulled out, they'd gone, and there been no no artillery, no bombing, no clues to the Germans that we were even within a hundred miles. And we'd drive into their towns there, and they were the most surprised people in the world to see us. You know. <laughs> Was it, you know that's a just a, a hard concept to think about. It, would it be like um, uh, all this uh, artillery and everything driving into Spokane all of a sudden and driving through town? I mean, is that what war is kind of like? I mean, is, well, after the Germans leave, after the fighting Germans leave, yeah. is there a village still going on with everyday life and trying to... No, because civilians cannot survive in, the, in a main battle area because of all the, the uh, bombing, the artillery, all that. they can't survive it. They're gone by the time you get there, the civilians. They're gone. They have to. In fact, even in France, you know, all through those countries, uh, uh, farmers would have to abandon their farms, leave their cattle were unattended, their horses were unattended. And sometimes we'd go through a, a town and the food would still be on the table. They had left because the battle was moving in. And this was one of the problems we had was, was uh, civilians clogging up the roadways. This was a serious problem. It, cut, it uh, curtailed the military traffic a lot, but they didn't just move out. So is it, is it like we would see today in Albania or something like that, where you see the the refugees that are leaving, they've got their carts loaded and they're hauling whatever. Yes, I saw, I saw that many, many times. And one of the tragic things I saw was these were uh, Russian displaced people and there was, they were on a big hay wagon pulled with a team of horses. And there was men, women, and children on that wagon. And they hit a mine about hundred yards off the road. They were going across the field and hit a mine. Tragic thing. They all were killed, of course. Tragic. That was just one instance. And there were thousands of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they basically become refugees. They were refugees. 
Yes. They head wherever. Well, they didn't know where they were going, but they were getting out of the out of the battle area. They had to go because, uh, like I say, civilians cannot survive in a combat area. So with the roads being clogged with them and all, how did you get through or what was that? I mean, when you guys came, did they split the road and part the waters? And Well, uh, sometimes we'd go around. Sometimes we'd, or the MPs just have to move them, move them off. In fact, it's, I don't know, did you see the, <laughs> the uh, show on, on Patton? Well, you remember, remember that uh, German with his cart and a horse he blocked the bridge? So Patton shot the horse and dumped him over the side. <laughs> I don't know if that happened very often, but uh, with George S. Patton, most anything might happen. But, uh, so there's just these ghost towns then that you went through? Kind well, of. most every small town w was pretty much a ghost town. Uh, it depends upon whether it was defended or not. Now, there are many villages we went through that the Germans did not defend, may have never even been in that town. A lot of those. Well, the, under those conditions, uh, the Germans didn't have to leave. They could stay. But if the Germans were holding this town, we were hitting them with uh, artillery, mortars, bombing them. Swains can't stay. We're going to go. And they know when it's coming because they hear it down the road. They say, hey, they're 10 miles down the road or 50 miles down the road. You know, we got to get out of here. Really? So if they, if they didn't defend it as some small town or whatever the reason yeah. being, at that point when you came into the town, was it? They put out uh, they put out sheets. They hang sheets out the window. In fact, if when we when we would approach a town, if we weren't sure whether the German soldiers were there or not, we would take a fifty caliber machine gun and fire a few bursts into the roofs of their houses, just to let them know what's coming. You know. And uh, if that was the case, you'd see the white sheets come out right away, right now. So then you pretty well knew that, uh, that the German soldiers were not there and that they were just civilians. However, sometimes there were some surprises where uh, you were told by the Bürgermeister that the German soldiers had gone when, in effect, they really hadn't. And the tanks were rolling out of the garages and stuff on you. <laughs> this happened in France. Because, I mean, to hear you describe, you know, the ha hanging on the sheets and the Geneva Convention and all that, it, it's kind of like little kids playing war. To, you know, bang, bang, you're dead, you count to 20, you come back out. So if they don't have white sheets, we're at war. If the white sheets are there, well, we can trust them. But did you did you let down your guard, or was it constantly? Well, down? we didn't let our guard down, but uh, but uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't open fire on them until we knew that... Uh, uh, that uh, they were not friendly or that the Germans had not gone. But that didn't happen very often, in, to my experience. It didn't happen very often. We had one experience where that happened. It was in France. And it was in the town of Vier, which was just outside of St. Lowe. Another hard fight. And uh, the leading elements of the battalion went in there. They contacted the burgomaster and several other of the male, older male civilians, and they said, no, the Germans have gone. So they moved on in the town on the basis that the Germans were gone, and all of a sudden, these damn tanks come driving right out of their garages there. Regimental commander shot the burgomaster around the spot. <laughs> Did, they t did the tanks take you enough by take them enough by surprise, or, or were well, they... it was it, we weren't ready for it. I wasn't there myself, but uh, our outfit was. But I wasn't there. But uh -huh. uh, yeah, it took them by surprise. They didn't expect to find any Germans there, let alone tanks. Were you always on the move? Yes, most always. Except there were some times when we'd have to stop for maintenance, uh, doing maintenance on uh, armored vehicles is a big chore in any place. They require a lot of maintenance, and maintenance takes time. So you'd have to stop once in a while and do your maintenance, you know, and refuel. And then sometimes uh, there'd be two or three days of rest and whatnot. But it wasn't very often that we weren't on the move. We were on the move most of the time.
So you pull in a little speedy lube and change the oil? Yeah, and, yeah, sure. I mean, do they have like a, 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 I don't know, like a machinist truck or something that followed along? Or how we, had, we had maintenance vehicles, but the maintenance was done primarily on the spot by the crew. It's what they call uh, uh, user maintenance. The crew maintained it. I mean, uh, uh, tanks, any track vehicle takes a lot of lubrication. There's a lot of lube fittings on there. They got to be lubed, and the filters got to be changed. And uh, we gassed up our five-gallon cans. One of our a, a jeep with a trailer on it would come up with five-gallon cans. That's how we got fueled up. Five-gallon cans. That's the stuff you don't think about about yeah. war and the fact of, uh, I mean, just the idea of maintenance. Yeah, big thing. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, battles were lost because of uh, logistics. Poor maintenance is one of them. Those vehicles only run so, so long without being taken care of. Just like your car. You don't uh, put oil in it regularly and, and do a few things here and there, and you're, you're not going to go anyplace. Now, I, I, you had a, a patch on your hat. Yeah. That is, that is the tank destroyer emblem. And our motto was, seek, strike, and destroy. And that was on there. That, is that Black Panther? Is that what I said? Uh, is that, that a cat? That, that's, a, that's a cat, a panther with a tank in its mouth. And then also Tommy Hawk, is that right? Is that yeah, Tommy Hawk, that's, that was the 19th Corps. Now, a Corps is a huge outfit. The, the, the largest single unit in the Army is an Army. Like Patton had the Army. Bradley had an Army. Uh, Mark Clark had an Army over there. And then comes the Corps. And there's three Corps to every Army. It has three different Corps. And the 19th Corps was one. That's the Tomahawk unit. And our division, the 29th Division, was assigned to the 19th Corps, and of course we were assigned to the 29th Division. So that's how that worked. It's amazing to try to keep track of, of uh, all this, because I mean there's you know thousands of soldiers and all the, yeah. the machinery and you know how you run a war yeah. is, a, is amazing. Another hairy experience I had was uh, when St. Lowe fell, they sent us down to Brest Brest was heavily fortified, and they were holding out. Brest had been the, uh, uh, that's where they maintained all of their submarines. So they were wanting to hold on to that, and they were fought pretty stubbornly. So they took, sent us down there, and the Germans had some 155 millimeter. Now, 155 millimeter, that's about a six inch diameter guns down there mounted in uh, concrete gun emplacements. The concrete was 14 feet thick. And uh, our heavy bombers bombed that thing day after day and all it did was scuff up the concrete a little bit. And these guns were raising havoc with the land forces. And uh, so our battalion commander got an idea that maybe with one of our direct fire guns, one of our three inch towed guns, we could move maneuver into a position facing the gun and maybe we could get some rounds inside the gun emplacement and damage the, uh, the uh, firing equipment. No way could we knock the pillbox out. And so the mission was assigned to our company and the company commander had the platoon leaders draw straws to see which platoon got the mission. Our platoon leader drew the short straw. Now he's got to decide which gun is going to go up there. So I drew the short straw. So we put our gun in position about 1,500 meters in the face of this, uh, of this 155 millimeter gun. And we put it in position at night. And the game plan was that the first daylight was to open fire on this thing, catch them sleeping and whatnot. Well, that was fine. We opened fire and we got about five rounds off. And all of a sudden, I think that every artillery piece and mortar that the Germans had in the Brest area opened up on us. Well, they knocked us off of the hill 
We lost our gun, we lost our half track. Fortunately, I had two men slightly wounded, but uh, that was a close call. Wow. That was a close call. We gotta switch tapes every second. It's beeping me in the ears. So. <laughs> but the intelligence found out that uh, what they were doing, so they ordered us to destroy that ship. So one of our guns uh, destroyed a, a boat <laughs> for a tank destroyer destroying a boat. It's kind of odd. So they were t using the Red Cross as a guide. Yeah, so. yeah, cover up. Huh. No. That's you know. It, Again, that's where that, that where we've created war and then we've set these rules and it was the South Pacific the rules were not accepted or but yet here is this uh, you know if you went into one city uh, you and the Germans would fire at each other if you were in another city yeah. it might be a safe zone so yeah we yeah. so that must be a weird well you know the main difference between the environment in the South Pacific and in Europe was that uh, in the South Pacific we were fighting an enemy that had stabbed us in the back at Pearl Harbor. From the time that happened, everybody literally hated the Japanese. I mean, they did. They hated them, you know. And as a result of that, in uh, the initial combat over there, like on Guadalcanal, for instance, we didn't take any prisoners. We didn't take any prisoners. They could have, didn't. Didn't take any. Whereas in Europe, we're fighting a guy that looks like you and me, you know, thinks like you and me, and uh, hadn't directly stabbed us in the back yet, you know. So it was a different environment. I mean, you uh, had a different feeling. We had a different feeling towards a German soldier than our soldiers had towards a Japanese soldier. And it's understandable. Yeah, it, 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 it is, because like you said, we got stabbed in the back, but yet there's still this, that person's going to shoot at me if I don't shoot at Oh, them. that's right. Oh, yeah, sure. It was kill or be killed, the name of the game, and more. That's one of the first basic uh, concepts, you know. No doubt about whether he's a, no matter what his nationality is. Is that a, a hard thing to learn? I mean, because we're a pretty humane society, and... Most of our life, we're taught the golden rules, and you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know when, when I would see uh, uh, German soldiers. And I came in contact with them, uh, both dead and alive, and uh, I always thought, well, somewhere, that young man has a mother and a father, maybe a sweetheart, you know. What a loss! And he was just there doing his job like I was. That's the hardest thing because we, we uh, uh, one gentleman we talked to really disliked dictators and said that the wars were, were run by dictators and you know it's the poor individual that suffers from the war and it's kind of that way. You saw a call to duty for your country, that German man, uh, German and son. the same call from his country. Yeah. yeah. And we're taught, you know, we read our history books over here and we did the right thing. And that's where it'd be interesting, the perspective of a, of a German, what they thought of World War II, even though they came out not being the victor, but did they end up thinking they were fighting for the right thing, or, or was it more like we feel, I don't know, uh, some other wars were? Well, I'm sure that the German soldier, the average one anyway, thought he was uh, fighting for a worthy cause, fighting for his country, fighting for the Deutschland, you know, and... Uh, which is uh, a normal thing. But it all boils down to the old saying that war is hell, and uh, we gotta quit that. The world's gotta quit that nonsense. Terrible. Do and you know, you can read about it, you can see movies about it, but you cannot grasp the full essence of the horrors of war until you've experienced it. And thank God only a small percentage of people have to do that. And that's, I think you touched right on the key thing. It, is it, it's like so many things that, that you can tell me all about it and all that, and, and, but, and, and I'm, 
mean, I've listened to lots of stories, and I mean, I know the atrocities that happened. I know, in a very um, scholarly way, but yet that reality of, of what it is that, that you're out there, what it was like, what the first time that you heard shell fire come in, what was the first time that you saw a soldier that had been wounded or killed, what and and what that must have, how that must have changed your life. Yeah, first soldier that I saw actually shot, and I didn't see the shooter, he was a sniper. He was probably a couple hundred yards away. It was in Normandy, and I was standing there in an orchard, we were in an orchard, and I was talking to an infantry sergeant, and we were two feet apart, like two guys would be standing there talking, you know. All of a sudden he, somebody shot me. <laughs> Shot him right to the fleshy part of the arm. Somebody shot me. Just yeah. As casual as that. Yeah. Just because of the shock, the surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just put on his first aid packet, and he went on his way away. But one of the, one of the most heartbreaking things I saw was in Normandy. And uh, before Saint Lo fell, it was a hot day, and the casualties were heavy. These two young aidmen had a wounded soldier on the litter, and they were walking down this road, narrow road. They were walking with him. And every once in a while, they'd stop and tend to this soldier. And then they'd go a little further and tend to him. And they finally lost him. Now, these two medics, I don't think they were over 20 years old, and they just sat down and bawled. Well, that's just one of those incidents that, that uh, you think about, you know, and how bad that those two young medics felt that they couldn't save this guy. That's the, especially when you think of the numbers of people that they were going to face at war is still a one one person war when it comes down to yeah. to that level. Do you think that there's a message from World War II for the generations to come that, that uh, you and I'll never meet? Well, first of all, they got to know about it. And the ones that know about it are not long for this world. So I think what you're doing here is going to help to correct that situation. But to answer your questions, uh, what lessons will we learn? I don't know, you know, if uh, human beings haven't learned what the horrors of war are yet, I don't know if they'll ever learn. Look what we had going this seven or eight years ago in uh, Desert Storm. I mean, fortunately, our country our losses were very, very minimal, but there was one hell of a lot of Iraqis killed, and they're human beings. Did you ever face a, a, a moral dilemma with war? No, no, not really, not really. Uh, I soon recognized the horrors of it and the uses of it in the long run, but uh, no, I didn't. I felt that uh, it was a duty, and I was doing it to the best of my ability. And uh, for guys, if, uh, if an enemy is going to shoot at you, you ain't got time to figure out whether <laughs> what I should do morally. <laughs> I mean, you're going to do what you were trained to do. You're going to hopefully shoot him first. Uh, one thing I was grateful for was uh, in my time, my role in combat, I never looked into the eyes of anybody that I shot. I'm sure that we killed and wounded a lot of them, but it was 1,500, 2,000 yards away. I didn't see it. But an infantryman, he's face to face with him and he has to shoot somebody. That would be a hard thing to do. So having the distance 
help well, your mind yeah, that find helped. a way to that helped. It's like it's like the bomber it's like the bomber pilot and his crew up there. He knows he's he's gonna kill people, but he doesn't see it. He really doesn't really doesn't uh, uh recognize what the hell he's doing, you know. It's just a big green land yeah. down there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the when you talk to high to high schools and schools? What what are the most? Is there a most common question that kids ask? No, not really. There were just a various questions, but I can't say there was any common question that they asked. But they just seemed to be generally answered, interested in uh, in what it was all about. P politically or emotionally or well, more emotionally than political. I don't think those high school sophomores were were much concerned about politics yet. When 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 you uh, got drafted, were you because uh, you weren't much older than those? No, that's were, right. W w was it a political thing for you, or or was it just the thing to do? You weren't looking at the big picture. Well, it was me. It was my thing to do. I mean. Uh, uh, all of my friends and my uh, male relatives of raft age were gone, and uh, so I didn't have any problem with accepting uh, my obligation to my to my country. I didn't have any hesitation. I I could have ducked out. The Navy would have got me a deferment. I could have ducked out, but I just I couldn't do that, and uh, I knew I made the right decision when my dad put me on the bus in Bremerton to go to Fort Lewis. He said to me, he said, I hate to see you go, son, but he says, I wouldn't have liked you anymore if you hadn't have gone. But he was a World War I veteran. But I knew I'd made the right decision when Dad told me that but that had to be, again, there's that interesting dichotomy. I mean, here's your dad who understands war. He was there. But yet, how hard that must have been for him to send you off knowing what you're going to face. But also that um, pride or patriotism that played into it all that. Right, and I'm sure that uh, that prevailed uh, in many other uh, with many other uh, individuals too. I don't think that that uh, my situation was particularly unique. Were, were there other? Did you brothers or sisters? I didn't have. I don't have any sisters, but uh, my brother and every one of my male cousins that were of age all went. All went, without exception. Did all, all your brothers come home? I had one. Yes. Yeah, he came home. So was your dad proud of you when you when you got home? Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was. Uh, did you remember where you were when you when you heard that uh, uh, the treaty was being signed? That uh, V E or V J Day? V E. V E Day. I was. Uh, we were up on the Elbe River, waiting, just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for something to do, you know, because it was over with, and we were, <laughs> tell you a little funny story, like I told you a few minutes ago, that uh, we were ordered to stop at the Elbe River, not to cross, but the Russians came across, and there was quite a few women soldiers, infantry soldiers, carrying submachine guns, so we were having a party in a room about the size of this, and the table. Not quite this big, but a big table. And uh, the Russians bought vodka with him. So we're sitting around this table, swapping, getting acquainted, you know, and uh, drinking vodka. Well, all of, all of the men had stacked their arms over in the corner someplace, you know, but not the women. Those women sat there at that table with their submachine gun across their lap. I never could figure out whether <laughs> they didn't trust us as a soldier, or didn't trust us as a man. <laughs> but, they, but 
those Russian women, they were not handsome. These were Ukrainian women. Some some Russian women are beautiful, but there's a lot of them from, from the Ukraine are kind of homely, you know, homely ladies. They were probably worried that a little too much of that vodka might start making them look good. Yeah, so they yeah I suppose, but that was, that was, that was, that was kind of humorous. Then our next duty was, uh, uh, they sent us back to uh, oh, a small town outside of uh, Bremen on the Wesser River, and we were doing uh, military government work. And that is, first thing they had to do was to take care of all the displaced persons, and there were thousands of them. These are people that the, the Germans had used for forced labor. They were living in uh, makeshift barracks, you know, fenced in. And guys, there was there were French people in there, Poles, Ukrainians. I don't know how many other nationalities were in there. And they'd been there so long. There were families, with kids. There were little kids too. And our job was to get these people prepared for return to their homeland. So now we got to segregate them. So we take all the French and put them over here in this compound. All the Ukrainians over here, and the Poles over here, over here. <laughs> Next morning you come back, they'd all be back together again. Well, you split up these families, they'll be back together again. So uh, we didn't put any guards on them. We didn't want to do that because they're not our enemy, you know. So finally, the only way we could do it was to put guards on them to keep them in there. And uh, <laughs> uh, then they would they would escape or leave their compound, and uh, they'd go out and milk the Germans' cows. They'd get up early in the morning before the German got go out and milk his cows. So we'd get these complaints from the burgomaster that. <laughs> Those DPs were milking the Germans' cows. <laughs> we finally, we finally got them separated and got them shipped out. But that was an experience. But it was better than than war. <laughs> Did you? So you didn't face any of the the um, concentration camps or anything. Like I didn't physically see them, but I saw some movies that uh, I doubt if the general public has ever seen and. Uh, well, all you had to do was see a little bit of that to recognize the horror of that. Uh, so the, the 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 camp that you were at the, that that was the slave labor camps, basically. Yeah, yeah, forced yeah. labor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, huh. mostly women, Ukrainian women. Ukrainian women. <laughs> I had I had the Ukrainian compound, and uh, it was fenced in. They were sleeping in barracks. Double bunks with uh, straw ticks for a mattress, you know. First thing we had to do was delouse them. And then uh, uh, we, we made the burgomaster of the town there feed these people. That was his obligation to keep them fed so they wouldn't be out and milking Fritz's cows and, and pulling up their vegetables out of their garden and stuff like that, you know. But anyway, I had two members of my platoon that were, they were buddies, and they had been together for three years, ever since the outfit started, you know. One of them was a short Swede from uh, Minnesota. He was a lumberjack, short guy. The other guy was a tall guy, he was an Irishman from New York. He was a stevedore. Well, they were on guard this night. so. I was making my nightly rounds to see that everything is, is going well, you know. And I couldn't find them. So finally I went in this one break and I could hear women giggling. I thought, what the hell is going on here? So I went in there and <laughs> the short lumberjack was going along, copping a feel on the women in the lower bunk. Just copping a little friendly feel, you know, the girls were giggling. And Sullivan, the Irishman, the tall one, was taken to the top. <laughs> they'd, had a, they'd had a few drinks of schnapps and, 
and they were just entertaining themselves, making the time go by quicker. But the girls thought it was funny. <laughs> but that's kind of an interesting. I mean, here you are. You have the the slave labor and and all that. The war is over, and they're probably. I mean, looking at you like, well, you aren't going to shoot us. Oh, no, you know, no. So oh, they weren't a bit afraid of us. We can do... Well, we were doing for them. We were taking care of them. We were feeding them. We were giving them medical attention if they needed us, you know. And uh, uh, they were kind of like star boarders, you know. And uh, But it was kind of humorous. <laughs> Another thing that, that was humorous was uh, the German prisoners. And we had some German prisoners there working at an ordnance depot. And... Uh, Each morning, a truck would come to the PW compound to pick up the Germans to take them to the ordnance depot where they worked. And we had displaced men, on, they were the guards. Well, some of them had half a uniform, some of them had no uniform at all, and they didn't look very military-like, you know. But they would usually be a Polak or a Frenchman or something like that, you know. And so here's a two and a half ton truck, and this guard, he's got a rifle. Yeah, he's herding him around. I'm up to get, tell him to get in the truck. So <laughs> they get in the truck, about 10 of them. They're all seated in the truck. Now the guard hands his rifle to one of the PWs so he can climb up in the truck. So he gets up in the truck, they give him his rifle back. <laughs> He takes out a pack of cigarettes, he passes the cigarettes around. <laughs> See, that's where, I mean, that's where yeah. really the surreal aspect of war is. Yeah. Of all of a sudden, the day before, or a month before, we're at war with each other, and now it's over, but we're still going to guard you, but... Well, hell, you, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have driven those German prisoners off because they were eating good, they were treated good, you know, and there's nothing back home for them, probably, most of them, you know. Probably the house had probably been bombed and uh, had nothing left, and so you couldn't drive them off. Same way with the PWs you had here in the United States. They were treated real good, you know. They never had it too good. They were out of the fighting, and, and they had uh, good three square meals a day. They had beer, movies. They had it all. <laughs> I know, I, and, and, and here the rest, I mean, while the war was still going on and the, the prisoners were in camp, I mean, here are people out fighting and sacrificing their life, and yet, you, yeah. you know, it's kind of a... That's a there, was, there was some hard feelings about that. Uh, at Camp Breckenridge, where we were just before we went overseas, there was a pretty good-sized detachment of German prisoners there. And uh, they would march down the street in a military manner singing their German songs, you know, which is all right, you know. But, but a lot of people uh, thought we treated them too good, you know, they didn't deserve that kind of treatment. And these, these uh, prisoners were the cream of the crop taken prisoner in North Africa. And it was literally their cream of the crop that they lost there. Wow. Did you, are you, uh, did you enjoy your time in the service? Uh, I don't know if that's a good choice of words, enjoy, but... Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I wouldn't want to do it again. But it, it, was an, it was an experience, and I think to some degree it molded my character some degree. I'll tell you, grow up quick. I mean, when you think of the responsibility I had at age 19, you know. Uh, of course, I was old for my age. The average 19-year-old kid today wouldn't be ready for that. He may, he may make a soldier, but uh, to assume the leadership position is something else, you know. Well, that's it. I, a lot yeah. of that... 18, 19 year old kids were teaching people that were 35 and 40 years old because they had some talent that came yeah. in with them. And yeah. Age became invisible to a certain extent, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, and some people are made to lead, some are made to follow, and you got to have both. And you just wish that the followers would know that they're not yeah. leaders. Yeah. <laughs> and we had, we had, I saw many, many good troops, not only during the war, but after the troops that were, would have made capable leaders, but they didn't want any part of leadership. They were just contented to be a grunt. But then you need the grunts. <laughs> that's right. And that's the biggest thing that we're, one of the things we're showing is is that, that, you know, history a lot of times it talks about all the heroes. 
but yet, and again, what is a hero and everything like that, but there were these thousands and thousands of people that had the, have this supply chain or whatever it was, and if one piece of that were missing. Oh yeah, you need it all. Yeah. Just like you talk about the infantry and the tanks, if they, one without the other sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah. forget it. Well, that's why uh, since the war, we've done away with the straight leg infantry that we knew in World War II, where the infantry soldier generally, he walked. Now we've gone to mechanization, and he rides around in a personnel carrier that protects him from rifle fire, mortar fire, machine gun fire, and it hauls him right up to the, to the final phase of the battle, where he has to finally get out with his rifle and do his thing. And, and we've even, uh, more recently, uh, we come out with the, the, what they call the Bradley fighting vehicle. It was a very controversial vehicle. Uh, but now they, it's actually a fighting vehicle. The uh, uh, personnel carrier was not designed as a fighting vehicle. It was a bus. It was a, it was a battlefield bus <laughs> to get a soldier from point A to point B <laughs> safely. But the Bradley fighting vehicle is, is something else, the whole new ball game. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, they have they have two of them here in Spokane at the uh, National Guard unit. Huh. What did you do to pass the time? If you had now you were on the move a lot, so there wasn't a lot yeah. of just sitting yeah. around. But I assume what did the guys talk about? No. Oh. You name it. You name it. Is that when it got to be average, everyday uh, life, kind of? Yeah, it got to be a lifestyle, you know. And, uh, of course, you talk about, uh, I got, hey, I got a letter from home, and this happened, this happened, this happened, you know. And we had one lad in my outfit that was from uh, we Wetumpka, Oklahoma. Wetumpka, Spallberg. And uh, they had a weekly newspaper. It was called the Wetumpka Gazette, and his mother sent him the Wetumpka Gazette. Every week he'd receive a copy. And we all looked forward to reading the Wetumpka Gazette. <laughs> we're, hearing, we're hearing about what's going on in Wetumpka. Just hearing about life the way you remember it. Yeah. Have you ever gone to visit Wetumpka? <laughs> no, no. No, I didn't. I didn't. See, again, that's the amazing thing to think of, of you guys tootling through Europe and everybody's blowing everything up, but yet mail could still get through and, and it may take a while, but and some packages once in a while got through. And yeah, well, mail, mail call was one of the most important things. I mean, uh, everybody looked forward to it. Uh, the sad part about it was there were some individuals that never got a letter. And you could just read the uh, the disappointment, you know. Then there were other guys, young, good-looking studs that got letters every day from girls. <laughs> my girls. my wife, my wife was very faithful. She wrote me a lot of letters, and my mother, my grandmother. So I got a lot. Of, I got a lot of letters. Now you were pretty much a newlywed when you went in. What did you say? Been five, five months. I consider that newlywed. Yeah, yeah, it was. Well, that must have been a, a challenging time. Well, it was. More for her than me, I think, really. You know, in some respects, I've often thought about this, that the families, in many ways, had it rougher than the, than the GI, in some ways. How, how so? Well, the serviceman, uh, he was well cared for. He was well cared for. I mean, he had everything he needed, all the needs, you know, that he wanted. And uh, uh, he knew he knew where his loved ones were, but uh, his loved ones may not always know where he is or what he's doing, you know. In fact, his uh, I wasn't I wasn't the uh, uh, best letter writer. I mean, I didn't write nearly as often as I should have. And of course, when my wife didn't receive a letter, she was thinking all kinds of bad things, you know. And uh, that, that was my neglect. Uh, some guys uh, 
did a little bit better job of that than I did. I assume it, at times it would become hard to decide what to tell them and what not to tell them. Well, yeah, you had to use your own judgment there, but your mail was, your outgoing mail was censored. And anything that you shouldn't say was cut out. If your, your platoon leader well, would censor the mail, and so you didn't say anything that uh, was classified or shouldn't be seen. But beyond the limits of that, uh, uh, you could whine about your situation, I guess, if you wanted to, or you could tell me everything is, is roses, you know. <laughs> was, it, was that one of the best things, getting mail from me? Oh, yeah, that was a good morale factor, a good morale factor, yeah. Yeah, there was only one time that we didn't get mail. We didn't get mail for five days. And when you don't get mail for five days, you know something is not right. And what was not right was that we were surrounded by the Germans in the rear pocket. <laughs> That's what wasn't right about it. <laughs> That's pretty amazing to think, five days yeah. not getting mail. Yeah. I mean, as I said, still, you're getting this mail overseas, especially at the time it was, getting it overseas, getting it sent out to all these people that are on the move everywhere. I mean, it's not like you get a mailbox yeah. somewhere, yeah. but they yeah. can keep track of you. And I think, I think by large, that they did a good job. Thank you very much. Well, you're most welcome. I, I hope I'm able to contribute something to your project. Every piece is a piece to the puzzle, and every yeah. different perspective, every uh, uh, how people deal with it. I mean, I, one of the ones that really sticks out right away in my mind is just the fact of you being able to tell me what it was like. But you know, I, I, you'll never be able to portray that 100 percent of what what war is. And that's, that's the hardest thing. Yeah. I think that's why, in some ways, we're doomed to repeat. History is doomed to repeat itself. I, unfortunately, I'm afraid you're probably right. Because we got guys like uh, like uh, that jackass in Iraq, Saddam. We got guys like that. And we just got rid 50 years ago of an Adolf Hitler. And, uh, and now you have oh, I don't know. Bin, bin Laden. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. There's always some of those guys around that that uh, haven't got the message. Probably never will. What does what does Veterans Day mean to you? Well, it's just uh, a day that everybody hopefully remembers the veterans and what their contributions were. Sounds like you you were. Pretty lucky all around that you didn't lose a lot of friends overseas. Uh, well, it depends upon a lot. Yeah, I, I lost uh, real, real close buddies. Probably lost only four. They were real close buddies. Uh, I lost a, lost a lot of soldiers that I knew, but they weren't close, intimate buddies. And I had my best friend. Uh, two days before the war ended, his destroyer hit a landmine. And it lifted that 32-ton destroyer high enough in the air to flip it over and turn it upside down. He was forcing me. He was standing out on top of the engine compartment and was thrown free and suffered serious damage to his legs. The rest of the crew... Five of them were inside the destroyer. They all perished. One of them, the driver, was from Puyallup. Well, that, you know, it's, it's always a tragedy, yeah. but even more yeah. of a tragedy of... And you know, it's one thing that, that uh, I regret I didn't do. Uh, <clears throat> when this happened, the company commander... Uh, asked me if I'd go up and retrieve the dog tags. Well, I said, yes, I would. So I went up and I retrieved the dog tags. And uh, when I got out of the Army, I thought to myself, I should go 
to Puyallup and look up the parents of Elmer Rosbach. And somehow I couldn't get myself to do it. I don't know why. I should have. And I knew I should have, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But I, I think now that it probably may have in some way uh, finalized the thing, someone coming, telling them that, that I retrieved his dog tags, you know. And I know that that was him that perished in that destroyer. But never got done. And again, if they had already put closure, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you know, and then to console myself with that, well, uh, don't open up Pandora's box. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, this might just open up uh, that wound again. Who knows? It's amazing. Fifty years, you know, fifty years ago, all of it, all this happened, and this, the, the the different ways that people have handled it come back they as soon as they got the decommissioned they got their papers honorably discharged and that was the end of it and for 50 years they, they put it away and, and yeah yeah of course uh, myself and like Roy Pearson and Kurt Baskin we stayed on in the reserve components uh, uh, Roy Pearson I served in the Army National Guard for 20 years and uh, I was active in the Reserve and National Guard until I retired in 1978. Really? Wow. So I actually did 38 years of military service. Whereas most of them, like you said, they come home, kiss their wives, go back to their civilian job, and, and maybe some of them hang out a flag on Veterans Day or something like that, you know. But they don't, most majority of them, do not stay in close contact with the military community, which I have. In fact, I still do volunteer work at Fairchild and the retiree activities office out there. I've talked to some that, that, that I mean, they're extremely proud of their service. Well, they should be. But yet, it was, we came back and like you said, they kissed their wife, they had a family to raise, the country was getting put back together, and they went on, and, yeah. and and they just when you talk to them, they just did their job. Yeah. I mean, it was it, it was like they said. I went to work at the factory. I I, I went to Europe. I went yeah. to South Pacific. I did my job, and yeah. and a lot them. of and a lot of them, uh, uh, particularly a lot of the ones that have had the extensive combat duty, don't want to talk about it. You know, are reluctant to talk about it. Get too emotional. And that's the hard thing. You know, it's really interesting because that's a dilemma I face here because there's some of that I want to know about, but only if somebody's willing. And, and uh, um, uh, I talked to just the toughest Marine you ever meet, and uh, he was a prisoner of war in Japan. And, and when he started talking about what happened to his friends, I mean, that was, was it. But then, like, um, gosh, I'm trying to think, Richard Carson that I talked to. I know Dick Carson real well. He didn't. Yeah. And, and I don't want to know the blood that got in court, but he just didn't didn't want to. We talk about the Ticonderoga getting hit, and uh, maybe maybe Dick told you this, maybe he didn't. He was a Navy fighter pilot off of a carrier, and he landed with his wheels on. <laughs> oh no! Put <laughs> her down on the. That was the end of his flying days. <laughs> Oh, Dick Carson, yeah. So I, I, I saw him just last Sunday. We had, we had a dinner together. <laughs> uh, He's quite a guy. Well, that's a, um, 